And this is a good example for me is you, where you can't have local sustainability unless you sort out some of the global issues. So as we know, the national credit rating agencies over the last year or so have been downgrading countries' credit worthiness. The US, Italy, the UK has just had a three-month warning. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that bad for local sustainability? Because actually, if you have alternative forms of finance, which is good in terms of different forms of organisations like credit unions, uh, that can make a place more resilient because actually they have a different governance structure and provide services perhaps in, in a more responsible way to people who can't access mainstream banks. Well, actually, when a country's credit rating gets downgraded, the cost of going goes up for credit unions too. And indeed, uh, the, the credit rating agencies have downgraded a number of the cooperative banks in the UK. So we're asking the question is, who the hell are they to do that? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, when there's a, a global problem like HIV AIDS, climate change, I, I thought the world comes together and agrees, well, here's the, we'll bring the best scientists, the academics, policy advisors, we'll come up with a strategy, people can choose to sign up or not sign up, and then civil society and the media will scrutinise it. I don't remember everybody coming together to agree what a good austerity plan is. And what the credit rating agency is saying, we decide who's got a good national austerity plan and who hasn't. So we don't like the US's, so we're going to downgrade you. We don't like Italy's, so we're going to downgrade you. They don't even like the UK's, and given the amount of spending puts in the UK, I, I'm very surprised. So really what we're going to do is we're going to rate them. And we're going to find out which ones are the junk and which ones are AAA rated in terms of the transparency of their methodology, how they get paid, their competencies to decide who has a good, bad, good or bad national plan. Because my understanding is these are just accountants, yet they're commentating on geopolitics. I found that quite interesting. Another area of our work, which, which, which is kind of the reason I was asked here, and I, I know I've gone on in a wide scope of issues, but uh, was really working with the local government to actually, what's the role of the public sector in the transition to a more a greener, inclusive economy? And part of that is in the context of, we've got major problems, as we heard from Christina. And this um, rather intimidating diagram, what it actually says is, there's less money in the system to take action, but actually problems are bad, things are bad now, but perhaps things are going to get worse. Yesterday we were slightly worried about waste recycling. Today we're somewhat worried about climate adaptation, particularly if you suffer from drought or flooding. And in some places you suffer from both. But tomorrow we're going to be worried about obesity, with people living longer, diabetes and so on. Major, major costs to the system. But that's not some of the problem. I think, again, something that Christina talked about is there's a scepticism to take action particularly issues such as climate change. Climate change is a bad news story. It's about making sacrifices now for benefits far off in the future. That's a really bad business case to take action. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see, particularly in Europe and the US, an attraction to the green economy. Hmm, it sounds entrepreneurial. It's about jobs. It's about apprenticeships. It just sounds better. Which brings us to really a, a, a key area of want, what I wanted to look at in terms of what's the role of the public sector, given in an age, in an age of austerity, in helping create and stimulate a greener and fairer economy. And so really what if Infran Gillis is saying is, yes, you've got less money, but you've still got tremendous assets at your disposal, and you can use them in a smarter way. <coughs> So in terms of supporting the fourth sector, regardless of your powers and budget, whether it's local government, regional government, or central government, directly through, um, or indirectly, or through induced mechanisms, through planning frameworks, through your purchasing power, there's amazing things you can do. Good example, in Santa Monica in the US, they have a specific education campaign that's about buying locally from social enterprises. And that is 
dramatically increase that sector. So basic messaging around buy from this business because they're nice people and they live in your street. It's a very simple campaign. Through to more um, facilitatory type uh, events such as in Helsinki, which is bringing together a number of social businesses to actually exchange ideas on good practice, innovation and so on. Particularly if you have very little money, it's an easy thing to do. The key thing to all of this though is about doing more with less within a, a complex system. And so I wanted to just, in terms of moving to the next level of detail, if you'll allow me, which is actually to take an example of, I think, how the public sector uh, around the world are actually trying to... Two minutes. Two minutes? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, um, for indulging me. How are they attempting to create a fair and green economy? What I'm calling the rise of low-carbon enterprise zones, which is essentially special economic trade areas around green growth. We see them spreading around the world, from Toronto and Canada around energy efficiency lighting, key to Ecuador about water resiliency, <coughs> China in terms of solar technology, uh, and Liverpool in terms of uh, offshore wind and uh, tidal barrages. I think what's most interesting about this though is they're not exactly the same because they're governed in slightly different ways and they were set up for different purposes. The key thing with Liverpool is it's not about carbon, <coughs> it's not about climate change, it's not about energy, it's about youth unemployment. 20% youth unemployment, the next generation apprenticeships, and so really bringing together social, ent social entrepreneurs around how do we match the new employment opportunities to, to, to estates, households and communities where people in that household have never worked and their parents have never worked. And really as part of that, understanding how one can build a framework for doing this in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a systematic way. And the key thing for me, particularly when we have local government working with businesses and communities, is understanding the, uh, the need to respect, for me, the key principle of subsidiarity. And what I mean by that is that, in terms of these new forms of parts, it is critical that responsible elected people are framing the way we're building these new sustainable settlements. And in some instances, there's a bypassing of local officials. Now, in some instances, that's understandable if one thinks they're incompetent or corrupt. But actually, how accountable are these new low-carbon public-private partnerships? And so really, if there, were, if there was a number of things coming out of that, I think for me it would be how one develops the right good governance structure. So just closing up, and I appreciate I've, I've brought it quite wide and come quite narrow, is first of all, public bodies, public bodies play a pivotal role, in, can, can play a pivotal role in nurturing the fourth sector. And you have tremendous assets at their disposal, so don't let them tell you they don't. <coughs> Great example from the UK is uh, the value of UK local government pension funds is £143 billion. Why aren't we accessing it to invest in low carbon industries that have a, are an attractive return in the investment through energy efficiency, energy supply and so on? We need to think very carefully about who benefits from this. And it's as true in the developed world as it is in the develop, developed world as it is in the developing world is Green jobs don't all, always mean good jobs. And we have to think about how we get people to buy in. And that's why I think the Liverpool example that I've been working on is particularly attractive because it's about youth unemployment, close to home issue. That we need, and as part of making that work, it's critical that we have good governance. Now, looking from the outside, it seems to me there's lots of innovation in the Basque Country already. There's clearly lots of powerful and world-renowned work around the fourth sector and cooperative enterprise and so on. My question would be, how does this fit into the Basque Country's wider resiliency plan around energy, food, water, financial services? How resilient are you to the National Credit Rating Agency's downgrading you? How resilient are you to further extreme weather? And I'll stop there. Thank you.